Chapter 16 Accidental Man A change of culture means a change of language. The languages of Christendom have been more shaped by the Bible than people realise. Language reveals how we think or do not think. One can see in the dramatic changes in the language of youth from 1900 to the 1990s how the faith and culture of the United States has been altered. Western languages well into the 20th century reflected also the Greco-Roman heritage. The vocabulary of thought was often classical, or an attempted fusion of the Christian and the classical. In fact, there is a philosophy of language and the discipline has a variety of emphases. What is language in essence and what does grammar tell us about thinking? These unlike questions are not our concern here other than to point out the complexity of the subject. A related subject is vocabulary. Our vocabulary reveals the perimeters the boundaries of our mind and our thinking. Man has always been speaking man, from Eden to the present, never the primitive grunter of evolutionary fiction. However much some youth today seem to be imitating the fictional grunters, they remain human beings, persons, albeit sinful ones. The old vocabulary of Christendom spoke of substance and accident. Substance. Latin sub plus stare, and the Greek hypo plus stasis, to stand under, refers to the basic reality in, under or behind things. The accidents of things is that which changes, is on the surface. It is related to our idea of the accidental. The word comes from the Latin accidens, accidares, to happen, chance, a befalling, any fortuitous or non-essential property. The idea of chance was important in Greek thought. In Christian thought, the word accident came to mean non-essential. Aquinas summarised it clearly in two statements, quote, That which is outside the substance of a thing and yet is belonging to the thing is called an accident of it, end quote. Again, an accident is, quote, that whose nature is to exist in another. End quote. The language of substance and accident was very important to Western thought until the rise of Darwinism. What Darwin insisted on as the sole reality was the triumph of chance. All things developed out of nothing through chance. The only reality is chance. There is no substance to the universe or multiverse. Only accidents. But with Darwin, substance was leached out of the universe and replaced with the omnipresence of chance. It was at this point that much criticism was levelled against Darwin. The world was ready to accept evolution as against God. But Darwin's theory, despite a slight blow to design, actually stressed chance variations. Thomas Huxley tried to defend Darwin, declaring, quote, But probably the best answer to those who talk of Darwinism meaning the reign of chance is to ask them what they themselves understand by chance. Do they believe that anything in this universe happens without reason or without cause? Do they really conceive that any event has no cause and could not have been predicted by anyone who had a sufficient insight into the order or nature? If they do, it is they who are the inheritors of antique superstition and ignorance and whose minds have never been illumined by a ray of scientific thought. The one act of faith in the convert to science is validity in all times and under all circumstances of the law of causation. This confession is an act of faith because, by the nature of the case, the truth of such propositions is not susceptible of proof, but such faith is not blind but reasonable because it is invariably confirmed by experience and constitutes the sole trustworthy foundation for all action. End quote. Huxley knew better. He used a strategy commonplace to scientists since then of accusing critics of superstition and ignorance. 
With great condescension, the critic is treated as a man too ignorant to know what he is criticising and as one who is painfully uncomprehending. The plain fact was that chance is basic to Darwin's perspective and to evolution. It still is. Hudson Hoagland, then executive director of the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology, wrote that there are, quote, only two answers to the question of how life began. It must either have risen spontaneously from non-living material or have been created by supernatural means, end quote. For Hoagland, the second alternative means, quote, science has nothing to contribute since the question cannot be resolved by the operational approaches of science, end quote. For Hoagland, chance can explain everything. For him, quote, evolution is creative, but its creativity is independent of purpose or design, end quote. R. W. Gerard, M.D., then of the University of Michigan, held that man's morals are accidents of his time and place. This is a logical conclusion. The universe and all things within it have been stripped of substance, the existence of God is more than denied. It is dismissed as an unscientific and irrelevant question. Is it any wonder that all that remains of man is accidental man? He is not a being created in the image of God, Genesis 1, 21-28. Rather, he is a struggling product of evolution. Lacking in definition by substance, he is a product of chance. Emile Durkheim, 1858-1917, in his Rules of Sociological Method, 1894, viewed criminals as evolutionary pioneers, exploring by their activities the next step in the evolution of man. Man, for Durkheim, had no fixed nature nor morality. He was an accident of an evolutionary process, and his accidental nature would change and develop with time. For those in this tradition, the criminal is an interesting figure and an important one. It was altogether logical for Jean-Paul Sartre to take a homosexual criminal and heal him as saint gene actor and martyr, 1963. Precisely because for Sartre and Genet God was denied, the new idea of the sacred was transferred to evil. The dedication to pure evil made Genet sacred in Sartre's eyes. God having been denied, there is no longer any true substance in all the universe. The accidental man, by his total dedication to an anti-God faith, affirms thereby the validity of the accident only, and the accident without substance has no point of reference and no meaning. Time in this framework has no meaning. Quote, Sacred time is cyclical. It is the time of eternal recurrence. End quote. The sacred has thus become the meaningless, the evil, not the good. This is the triumph of the accident, and hence of accidental man. Let us consider the meaning of this pure evil, this triumph of the accident over substance. One of the characteristics of life in the Western world since at least 1960 has been the rise of mindless crime drive-by shootings, the random killing of innocent people and the ready indulgence and torture of people who have done nothing are examples of mindless crimes, uncaused evil. Now, Christian ethics has sought to further good for good's sake, not a self-serving virtue, but one motivated by gratitude toward God for his goodness. Rather than a man-centred cause for self-promotion, Christian virtue is required to be goodness for goodness' sake. Virtue for virtue's sake. The Christian must not avoid murder, adultery or theft out of fear of the consequence, but out of a love of God and his moral law, out of a love for virtue. Virginity and chastity are not to be adhered to out of a desire to gain a better spouse, a better reputation or to avoid a disease, but out of a regard for virginity and chastity as the true way of life for virtue's sake. Now, evil seeks the same purity of dedication to evil. The purely professional criminal isn't crying for the money, for profit. He has no desire to do more than steal or kill as necessary. 
The perpetrators of mindless crime may steal or kill, but their basic objective is evil. A young man who enjoyed seducing and then leaving girls who were virgins responded when someone asked him why he went after some girls who had no special appeal. His response was, he wanted them because they were virgins. The appeal was evil for evil's sake. It was despoiling virtue. The accidental man hates the substantive life and he wants to prove that it is a fraud by destroying it. An interview with Fareed Zakaria, managing editor of Foreign Affairs, Lee Kuan Yew, Prime Minister of Singapore, except for an interlude from 1959 to 1990 when he allowed his deputy to succeed him, spoke of the chains in the United States and elsewhere that had lessened his admiration and respect. Quote, Westerners have abandoned an ethical basis for society, believing that all problems are solvable by a good government, which we in the East never believed possible. End quote. Centuries ago, the East was wealthy and powerful, but certain ideas it held had evil consequences. Buddha's belief in ultimate nothingness was destructive of cultural strength and morality. In China, Philosophy preceded Hume by many centuries in its epistemological scepticism. One philosopher questioned the real world. He held that it was difficult to say whether or not the dream world or the waking world was real. Such thinking meant cultural paralysis because, in its own way, it reduced humanity to the level of the accidental man. As reported by the Lofton Letter, quote, According to the George Barner Research Group, four out of ten people who call themselves evangelicals don't believe there is such a thing as absolute truth. Says Barner, quote, It's pretty frightening. Of all US adults, 71% reject the idea of absolute truth. End quote. To reject absolute truth is to reject Christianity. The only God possible in such a universe and the only logical Christ comes out of the cosmic accident. God and Christ then, if existing, are simply struggling in a cosmic accident to gain some kind of relevance. There can then be no absolute God, no decree of predestination, and no substance to law and morality, nor to man. Because the Western world has become the realm of accidental man, it is in danger of becoming the realm of fading men and fading cultures and nations. Accidental man is oblivious to all this. He believes God to be dead, and because of this absurdity, is himself dying. <laughs>